the call to worship, we'll read responsibly. Christ our Savior is risen from the dead. Hallelujah. Pray for him. We who once suffered in death, who once cried in despair. Now we know victory over death, now we know joy over despair. For God has raised Christ from the grave, the tomb is empty, and the death has been defeated for all the earth. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we have celebrated the mystery of Jesus' resurrection. Now help us by your grace to bring forth fruits worthy of our risen Savior, so that we may follow in his footsteps. We pray in his name, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. I was hoping there would be some children for the children's talk. Here's one if you would like to come up here. I have a special children's talk with you. Uh, our gospel today is kind of interesting. We find people behind locked doors. And they're behind locked doors because they're afraid. Now, why would somebody come up afraid? Are you ever afraid? You're never afraid. I'm glad you're not afraid because I get afraid. I get afraid several times for one reason or another. I have something here for you. Something special. I don't know if you can do this or not. Can you do this? If I can do it, I don't know. Can you do that? Can you do that? No? Well, if you want to try, you're welcome. Ah, uh, I brought that with me because I had a friend in seminary who went through the Alaskan earthquake in 1964. Now, you know what an earthquake is, I'm sure. <laughs> you don't know? Well, in this building, this whole building was shaking. Now the ground underneath you was shaking. That would be an earthquake. Okay? Can you imagine this whole building shaking? And the ground shaking under your feet? Has anybody here ever experienced an earthquake? You have. Where at? In Colorado. In Colorado. What did it feel like? It was kind of weird. The, the ground was vibrating. And you, like you said, you could feel the building kind of swaying. Yeah. And it was a pretty strong one because you couldn't hardly stand on your feet. So we went and just went into the hallway and still it was over with. How long did that take? That one lasted probably about three or four minutes. Three or four minutes. And what else? Yes. Yes, I lived through the Bakersfield earthquake in California. And I was about two or three years old, and I remember all the cabinets in the kitchen opening up all at one time, and all the dishes came flying out of the cabinet and crashed to the floor. Sound familiar? That scared you. That was uh, right there, smack dab in the middle of California. <laughs> that scared you. I'm sorry. That scared you. I'm sure. Oh, it was very frightening. And my dad tried to reassure me. And I was afraid that someone maybe had not made it through the earthquake. That was my concern, because right. I saw the damage and figured that part out. And my dad <coughs> said that 
One lady, a lady got hurt when a, downtown when a brick fell on her. So that's how he handled it. But it's, it's very frightening. Who else? Who else? Well, Wendy and I experienced an earthquake in her father's house up in uh, Bella Vista, Arkansas. We were there one time and the whole house started shaking just for a moment or two. It was because of an earthquake that happened in Oklahoma. Uh, but we felt it. No question about it. Now I bring that up because my friend at seminary said when he went through that, he noticed that some of these strong, husky guys who could do all this weightlifting and everything, they would just become so afraid they'd fall down on the ground crying. And other people, other guys who were not as strong, weren't as muscular, they went through it and helped other people through it. And it was because of something inside of them that were that was able to help other people. Now that's what the disciples <coughs> needed in our gospel today. They needed help. And that's what I want to talk with y'all about today. The disciples needed help. And it came from Jesus. <coughs> Okay, so I've got a couple pictures here of the last earthquake. I don't know if you can figure out what's going on in it or not, but I'll pass them around and y'all can look at it, try to decipher what's going on. Can you figure out anything in that? Well, this ground here is about eight feet higher than that part of the ground. Because there was about a, at one point there was a 32 foot dif difference in the ground level. But I'll pass this around. Some of the adults might be able to, this is a different picture of a road torn up from that earthquake. Okay? So I want to thank you for helping me even though you didn't experience earthquake, I'm glad you didn't. And I don't think anybody around here is ever going to experience an earthquake. I don't think they've ever had an earthquake around here. Okay, thank you. We're going to uh, sing hymn number 345, Crown Him with Many Crowns. Let's stand.
confession we will read together. God of all worlds and all time, we gather to the Lord's hands for this season of resurrection. May our worship be as Jesus Christ. forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now, Thomas, called Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them, though the doors were locked. Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here, see my hands, 
Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Now Jesus did many other miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Here ends the Gospel reading. Brothers and sisters in Christ, <clears throat> when I was serving a congregation in Liberty, mother and daughter stopped by our church. She said, our family is Lutheran. We've just moved here recently from Minnesota. So I warmly encouraged them and invited the family to worship with us. She <coughs> then said she had stopped by <coughs> just to check out what we offered. She asked, for example, if we had an active youth program, a children's choir, and on and on and on about various activities. I said, no, we don't have much to offer in the areas that you're asking about. Perhaps one of the larger churches in town could offer more of what she was looking for. Finally, she and her daughter walked into the worship area with me, and after looking around, they began talking with each other. Mutually, they agreed this just wouldn't do. I asked, what are y'all talking about anyway? They said, the decor of the church just wouldn't work as a setting for the daughter's upcoming wedding. that they left. What do you look for in a church anyway? Church ads in Houston Chronicle are filled with ads trying to impress people. Yet other churches, by contrast, appear to have almost nothing Take, for example, the church in our text today. <clears throat> Here we witness the disciples huddled together after the resurrection in a locked room. It's our first glimpse of the church in its earliest days. It's not a very pretty sight. Not a very pretty sight at all. Near the end of his life, Jesus had carefully tried to prepare his disciples to be a devoted and confident fellowship of faith. They were to be a community filled with love with their arms open wide and their welcome mat out for all to come in. And instead, <coughs> here we discover them barricaded in a room with the doors bolted shut. They were to be the people who strode boldly into the world to bear fruit in Jesus' name, a people filled with the power of the Holy Spirit, and instead, they're cowering in fear, 
hoping nobody will find them in their hideout. In chart, we see the church at its worst, scared, <coughs> disheartened, and defensive. If this little sealed off group of Christians were to place one of those cheery church signs in the Saturday paper, what would they say anyway in that ad? The friendly church where all were welcome? Hardly, unless one counts locked doors as a sign of hospitality. The church with a warm heart and a bold mission? I don't think so. They were more like the church of sweaty palms and a timid soul. Indeed, John paints a picture of a church with nothing. No plan, no promise, no program, no youth ministry, no powerful preaching, even no parking lot. <coughs> Nothing. <coughs> In fact, all we can say about this terrified little band of sniveling disciples huddled in a room behind a bolted door is that they have only one thing going for them. The risen Christ. That's the only thing they have going for them. The risen Lord. And yet, isn't this the main point of the story? In the final analysis, this is a story of how the risen Christ pushed open the bolted door of the church. Opened it up to everyone. We must recognize that the life of every vibrant church is filled with the life of our risen Lord. Every church, no matter what it may claim in the newspapers or how much money they may have in the bank or what kind of programs they may operate is nothing if it only relies upon themselves. Without the presence of the risen Christ in it, that church is nothing. John's Gospel strips away such an illusion. Look at the church of the disciples huddled defensively in a darkened room, peeking anxiously through the curtains see if somebody is out there. <clears throat> Without the risen living Christ, the church is hollow, empty of any meaning and purpose. The good news is that into this midst, into the midst of this void, fear-filled church, the risen Christ came and said to them, Peace be with you. Into the emptiness of their community, Jesus came to fill the vacuum space with his peace and abiding presence. What Jesus says to this church is remarkable. Given the circumstances, we may have expected that the risen Christ would scold them. Shame on you for being so afraid. Did I not call you to share the good news with others instead of hiding behind locked doors? Go now. Do what I've asked you to do. Or perhaps the risen Christ would come <coughs> would have come to bell 
out these terrified incompetence. But taking over the task himself, he may have said, you obviously can't handle this job. I gave you a divine mission to do, but here you are. Here you are, only hours after I leave you, in a hideout, shaking in your boots. From now on, I'll just have to do the job myself. But no. No, Jesus does not do any of that. Does not say any of that. Jesus neither scolds them or relieves them of their responsibility to this church of nothing. Jesus gives a strange set of words and actions. He says, peace be with you. He then shows them his hands and his side. And again, he says, peace be with you. He tells them again that he is sending them out into the world just as he, Jesus, was sent out into the world. He breathes on them and says, Receive the Holy Spirit. He commissions them to declare binding acts of forgiveness. Perhaps, perhaps to your eyes and ears, this is not a collection of sayings and deeds. But to the earliest readers of the Gospel of John, their meaning could not be more clear. Each of these things that Jesus said and did is a clear symbol of some aspect of the church's life today. Peace be with you is often part of our worship each and every Sunday. Likewise, being shown Jesus' hands, side, Jesus' body, has a clear relationship to the Lord's Supper that we share. And the breathing of the Holy Spirit on them was reenacted by the early church practice whenever they baptized a young child or baby, the pastor, the priest, would breathe on that child, symbolizing the child receiving the Holy Spirit. Forgiving sins it's, is at the heart of a congregation's inner life of confession, absolution, and reconciliation. Put them all together, this how is how the risen Christ comes to call us to be his worshiping church, even today. These are signs of Christ's church. The risen Christ comes to the church with nothing and gives it his everything, providing it with what it truly needs to be the church. Worship, forgiveness, reconciliation, healing, and mission. These are the true marks of the Christian church. Without the risen Christ's presence, any congregation that cowers in fear of sur just surviving, just as these scared disciples were doing, will wind up being nothing. But in the risen Christ's presence, there is uplifting worship, bold mission to the community, and a healed Christian fellowship. The great theologian Karl Barth once said, I believe in the Holy Catholic Church does not mean that we believe in the church. 
for the church does not save us. It means rather that we believe that God is present and at work in the church. That is, in this assembly, the work of the Holy Spirit takes place. We do not believe in the church as a building, but we do believe that in this congregation, the work of the Holy Spirit becomes evident in and through the life and mission of this congregation of believers. Each of you are the empowered ministers of God. The work begins with you. Each of you who believe and trust in the risen Savior, who fills you with life and hope. Remember, God so loved you that He gave His only begotten Son, that if you believe in Him, you will not perish, but have eternal life. Remember that Thomas, better known as the doubter, was not with the others that first Easter. He said, I will not believe unless I can put my finger into his nail scars and my hand into his side. And in effect, he is saying, look, it's not every day that somebody raises himself from the dead and claims to be God. I need evidence. I need evidence that it has really happened. He was the scientist of the group. He needed first to check the evidence. Eight days later, Jesus came again, the doors having been shut, and stood him in their midst and said, Peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, Reach out here with your finger. See my hands. Put your hand into my side and be not believing, but believe. Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. And Jesus said to him, Because you have seen me, have you believed? Blessed are they who have not seen me and yet believe. Jesus rebuked Thomas, <coughs> Thomas's unbelief, but not his acknowledgement of him as God. I know, I know Trinity Church may not be like a big Houston church, but you can and do carry a strong ministry in the spirit of the risen Christ. Be thankful the risen Christ lives in and through you today. And that through you, Christ's ministry can be done as you worship together and as you serve him here in this community. Amen. Peace which passes all understanding through your hearts and your minds in Christ. stand and pray together. Let's pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Lord God, Heavenly Father, in this Easter season, keep before us the vision that our risen Lord has given us. And as your children, may we continually rejoice in the resurrection of our King. Lord, we pray that you would be with the people of Ukraine. Help them be resolute 
in their fight against tyranny. Move the leaders of our country as well as other world leaders to be more bold in our support of Ukraine, giving them what they need in their struggles. Move the oppressors to lay down their weapons of destruction so that together we may be able one day to rebuild the lives of that country. When we have our moments of doubt, help us see signs of your presence through your word. When we do not hold on to your promises which are sure and true, forgive us, O oh Lord. May the news of Easter lift our feet so that they may dance and skip with joy. Grant your blessing on the sick and for those who mourn, especially those on our prayer list. Gloria Cain, while she's in the Rehabilitation Center at Regency. Noah Moore, as she undergoes cancer treatment. Melvin Chambrera, now while he's at home. Ronnie Pittman and Rosie Chambrera, who are both at Regency. Susie Telke, as she fights uh, her illness. Be with each of them and grant them healing through Jesus. And those whom we lift up before you in our thoughts or on our lips. We pray for all for Jesus' sake. These things we ask in the name of Christ Jesus, our Lord and our God. Amen. Moved by the Spirit, we pray now as our Lord has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us.
Exodus chapter 23, verse 9, we find these words. <clears throat> For the three annual festivals, Moses tells the people, Best of the first fruits of your ground you shall bring to the house of the Lord your God. Will not accept the morning offering.
transformed us in love, renews us through grace, and will transform us into glory. Bless you this day and every day. In the name of God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, go in peace.